there's a principle in Indian dramatic theory that the happiest plays are those in which there's a main plot where the hero or heroine gains a desired objective, and a subsidiary plot where a friend of the hero or the heroine also gains his or her objective, and the two of them help each other along. In other words, the main plot doesn't work without the subplot, the subplot doesn't work without the main plot, and both people come out winning at the end. That's the happiest kind of play. And the same principle applies in the relationship between the monastics and the laity. The monastics need time to practice. Need the time, need the support of the laity in order to practice full time. And the laity in the turn need contact with people who are giving their whole lives to the practice. So they're not just stuck with other lay people who are giving half time to the practice as their teachers. So they gain guidance in their path, and they gain the benefits of all the forms of merit, generosity, virtue, meditation. It's through this symbiotic relationship that everybody benefits. This becomes especially dramatic on a day like today with the Katin. There's a lot of activity. A lot of people have to be fed. And they came to support the monastery, support us in our practice. And so we have a responsibility on the one to make sure that they're happy in their generosity. The Buddha once said there are six characteristics of a really happy gift, three pertaining to the donor and three pertaining to the recipient. The donor is happy beforehand while thinking about giving the gift, happy while giving the gift, and then gratified when looking back on the fact that it was a good gift, it was a good thing to give that gift. As for the recipient, the recipient either has to be free of greed, aversion, and delusion, or working on the path to be free of greed, aversion, and delusion. And you look at it one way, those six characteristics, three, the three that apply to the donor are the donor's responsibility, and the three that apply to the recipient are the recipient's responsibility, but they're actually mutual responsibilities. In other words, when you receive a gift, you have to behave in such a way that before giving, the donor feels good, while giving, after giving, the donor feels good and satisfied that it really was worthwhile giving that gift. This means that we don't pressure people into giving beforehand. We receive the gift with respect, and then we use it well after we've received it. At the same time, the donor has to behave in such a way as to look for people who are practicing for the end of greed, aversion, and delusion, and they respect their need for time. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship we have going here if everybody takes on their responsibilities. So now that we're waiting for the cloth to dry. Let's work a little bit on getting rid of our greed, aversion, and delusion. Particularly, we want to work on the delusion, because that underlies all the other defilements. And so we try to develop the quality of knowingness in the mind. It means being very honest with yourself as to what's actually going on and trying to be as alert as possible, and developing equanimity so you can really see what's actually happening. In Thai, when they're talking about the, the knower or awareness itself, they're basically talking about this quality of equanimity, 
the part of the mind that just receives things, knows what's happening, basically registers what's happening. and just looks on. Now that quality of just registering is not going to be enough. I mean, it really helps see through a lot of things you didn't see before, but it also has to be motivated by the desire to see through, particularly to see through the things that are causing suffering. So even though it may seem totally without preference, it is motivated by the desire to see things clearly in a way that you haven't seen them before. To so be very clear about that desire, that it is necessary for this quality of knowingness to develop. We work with the breath, trying to be alert to all the different ways the breath is moving in the body, all the different levels of the breath. So we can also become more and more alert to different levels in the mind levels of awareness that may get covered over by our ordinary concerns, our ordinary desires, our ordinary considerations. There are many layers to your awareness in the same way that there are many layers to the currents in the ocean. I was reading a little while back that in addition to the currents that move along the surface of the ocean or just below the surface, there are some very deep ones. Apparently there's one current in the Atlantic where the water drops down near Antarctica because it's cold, and then it travels along the bottom, it goes up north, and many hundreds of years later that water finally arrives up at the northern part of the Atlantic. And it's the same with the body. There are some levels of breath energy that are very still, others that have a constant flow, others that flow back and forth. We try to become sensitive to these because the more you can know about the breath, how it's acting in the body, the more you become sensitive to different parts of your own awareness that you didn't know were there before, and particularly this part of the mind that's just watching. So sometimes when you read about the different teachers who emphasize watching the mind or observing the mind, and say, well, why are we spending so much time with the breath? Well, it's working with the breath helps expand your sensitivities and become sensitive to areas of the mind that you wouldn't have known otherwise if you just float along on the surface of whatever defilement is coming your way and just trying to accept that. You don't really learn much, and there are many layers of the mind that go totally unexplored. So as you're watching the breath, try to get things as still as possible so you can see the more subtle layers. John Lee talks about breath energy circling around in place or constantly moving in one direction. Say the, there's an energy that comes up from the soles of the feet that goes up the legs, up the back, up through the spine. It's always going up. And notice when you need that, when your back is feeling weak, when your posture is bad. Remind yourself there is this level of energy coming up, coming up, coming up that can give you strength. When there are parts of the body you found that you've been ignoring, you want to really be conscious to expand your awareness to keep them in mind. Because you find that you become more and more aware not only of the breath, but also those areas of your awareness. Things open up more. There are fewer blind spots in the mind where your defilements can hide. So these are some of the ways in which working with the breath helps us to overcome delusion. We see the process of fabrication, we try to calm it so that the blatant levels of fabrication can get out of the way and we can see the more subtle levels and just keep on going in, in, in like this. That way we get to the more subtle levels of your awareness.
that can give you a more solid foundation. So the gifts that people give to you as a meditator really do bear them great fruit. That's one of the motivations we have for practicing, because we're not the only ones who benefit when people give things to us. And we've used those things well. They gain a sense of happiness, a sense of satisfaction that the gift really did accomplish something worthwhile. So we can think of this as a responsibility when we're thinking, when we're feeling lazy. If we're feeling too weighed down by responsibilities, just remind yourself this is how true happiness comes about. This is one of the fine things of the Buddhist teaching, is that by developing our own best interests or pursuing our own best interests, we're also acting in the interest of other people. There are very few courses of action in the world for which that is true.